Welcome, everybody. I'll just give uh, another minute to allow other people to join. Okay, why don't we get started and maybe what I'll do is I'll repeat the basic uh, directions I'm going to say now. Um, so welcome everybody to these, uh, this energy, ag and food chains discussion. Um, you saw the questions uh, and I guess in some ways maybe uh, this group is a little different in the sense that we've had three technical presentations already uh, on farm gates transport and waste. Uh, and so I think in some ways uh, for us, uh, the interesting points would be uh, to what extent are you doing work in which you're analyzing this issue maybe in a different way? Uh, and I think the second important point is uh, what are other areas uh, where we need to do more work? So what I would propose is why don't we use the hand raising function uh, and if you're interested in talking, if you just would raise your hand uh, using the participants function, uh, and I will call on you. So just again to repeat, if you would like to make a comment, just raise your hand. The hand raising functions. If you go to participants, you should see. Is it in chat? Let me just see. It should be in participants. Kevin, why don't you raise your hand so I can see, make sure it works. <laughs> Great. Well, is there something you would like to say? <laughs> well, sure. I mean, um, we could start the uh, conversation on a number of different topics. I think one area that I'd be curious if anybody here uh, is knowledgeable about and Philip brought this up earlier in his overview of energy used, but is energy uh, that goes into creating inputs uh, that, that go into on-farm production. Uh, that is currently something we haven't looked at yet. Uh, my basic understanding is that um, synthetic fertilizers require a fair amount of energy. Uh, and, and I'm curious, uh, uh, you know, we're going to move forward into the space, but if anybody has uh, um, some knowledge or ideas about how to think about uh, energy for inputs into farm production and, and where to start with that. Or Philip, maybe you've thought about this a little bit already uh, and, and have some, some developed some ideas uh, uh, um, or not. So I think just as a general proposition, I think one area that we're actually lacking enough uh, analysis is really understanding. In some ways it's related to some of the work you've seen in terms of the uh, embedded emissions or embedded em energy in a lot of manufactured goods. I don't think we tend to actually <clears throat> sufficiently analyze uh, the opportunities to decarbonize by becoming more efficient in terms of how we produce things. This is something I know the IA is starting to look at a little more. Uh, I think the fact of the matter is when you look at opportunities to decarbonize, if we can't figure out a way to uh, reduce the embedded energy and the embedded emissions in, s in all so many of the goods and services that we produce, we're going to have a big problem. Alex has uh, raised his hand. Thank you very much, Alex. Let me let you go first. Thanks. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of really good discussions here. So maybe I can uh, kick a couple of things off. So first of all, I'm Alex Ruane. Um, I'm at NASA GIS and Columbia University. Uh, I'm also the science coordinator for AGMEP. Um, We've been doing a lot of work within AgMIP around understanding the food system. And that's, of course, a huge topic uh, of which emissions and, and energy is, is a, a big part. 
Um, but one of the things we're trying to do is figure out how to separate kind of the data problem where we ask the question of do we know what is actually out there uh, from the kind of system understanding where we actually figure out like are we missing whole chunks of the of the food system or energy sources or processes in the biophysical side and then there's the modeling problem and on the modeling problem i would say that the challenge is to get beyond the observed condition so ask ourselves if this changes how will that next thing respond you know what what type of shift whether it's socioeconomic or policy or environmental um, or some unforeseen event what would cause the the overall food system to shift and of course the easiest analog is recent years where we see trends um, and attributing those trends is a whole other issue but the nice thing about models is we might be able to go back and say you know to what extent was it driven by this or that uh, that would allow us to get into really interesting um, perspectives of counterfactuals and ask what could we have done differently and then of course it allows us to look forward and say you know of the options of those pressures those stressors that are coming uh, how is it going to affect us and what is the potential to intervene so I've just thrown a lot on the table here but I guess what I'm suggesting for a breakout set of conversations is around whether people really have models that are able to change these elements um, such that we can get beyond just a data and understanding problem into some kind of modeling. Thanks a lot for that, Alex. Um, any reactions? Yeah, one thing that I'd like to point out um, that this is, this is a data problem issue that we faced when analyzing transport is a lack of like a model that we could understand exactly what is the, what is, how can we account for transportation, for food transport? Uh, unfortunately, we need to rely on, on we, we cannot rely on like a model that we can just like use some variables or like uh, understand from like, um, a satellite point of view. You know, like emissions, and we can say, understand like we have a specific share to get, like what is a transportation share, share using like uh, satellite data, and how can we specifically um, come up with a number for what is the uh, what is food related to to the uh, transport emissions? So, in transport, we see that we don't have such models, and and no one has really understood how to how to build some, this kind of model so i bring this to everyone here to discuss and like how are, how's the how's the best way to do it um how would you do it how would you um what are what are things that you, you would change uh input output analysis seems so far seems to be like the best analysis so far that's what the USDA has been doing. That's what that's what the European Commission has been doing. Um, yeah, we're open to other approaches as well. Um, a recent a recent paper that looked into food systems, they're looking into uh, each um, different products and seeing lot life cycle analysis of each product and accounting for like each part of of, of the of the production, consumption, etc. Right. Uh, so there are different approach, approaches. Um, how would you do it? What? what any thoughts? <laughs> any reactions to what, what Julia or Alex mentioned? I mean, I'll add a complexity to us in some ways. Going back to you, Alex, which is, which is to to what extent. Are the models that you're dealing with looking at these issues of changing populations, changing, changing GDP, and I think more importantly, rising standards of living, which obviously will have, have an impact on all of these food issues? Maybe I'll respond to that directly. So there's even in that modeling realm, there are big questions about what do we explicitly model versus what do we take in a scenario or storyline approach. Um, so certainly if it comes to population growth and socioeconomic development, you probably wouldn't turn to an agricultural model for that. Um, that would become inputs and, um, and kind of scenarios for those models. But there is a question of if we expect those dietary transitions, if we expect the, uh, the uh, population growth to concentrate in cities, if we expect uh, markets to 
be more connected. What does that mean for investment in refrigerated shipping? What does it mean for investment in uh, uh, high high performing fertilizers versus organics and you know other things that have different energy profiles? Um, so some of it is is like a translation from those scenarios into food system shifts um, that we're not necessarily going to get from the outside, um, but is the kind of thing that if if we have some food system models, um, which I would say are, are not fully developed, um, but, but if we have some of those things and we know that they could be shifting, um, even that translation from the scenarios into an actual setting of a system model would be really valuable. Yes, no, I agree. Uh, Samir? Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself briefly. Uh, I've been following the talk well from the beginning i guess at the top of the hour here in the in the netherlands um very nice discussions i'm gonna ask actually a couple questions i don't know if they're completely the right place for it but you referred to organic systems um and uh and okay we we also look at the emissions and we realize that having a more vegetarian plant-based lifestyle obviously has a great impact there and then to, to deal with localization instead of uh, importing food from all over the world because of our habits um I just wanted to put it out there. Um, let's assume that we have all the data uh, and that we have the, and the models are reasonable uh, enough that we can have good discussions on a political level. Would you, how would you then, um, since we've heard just now that the NDCs don't really take into account any of the food waste issues, let alone sustainable diets and everything that we already know for years and years, I think that's the bigger question to uh, to address. How do we put that into practice, into policy, into our food trade policy, into our so that we're talking about you know ministry of, uh, of all kinds of ministries, not just agriculture but also uh, trade, right, and economic policy. So I'm more interested in how we can actuate this information as opposed to uh, you know going over the nitty gritty of the models themselves. Of course, that's important, but moving from the science to the actual practical aspect, I think that's the biggest push that we need right now, especially if we want to cut down 50% of our emissions in the next 10 years and food is what, one third of that almost. So this is for me, the biggest uh, translation of issues. Yeah, no, I think that's, those are excellent points. Um, maybe let me let me give some quick reactions and, and then uh, if other people wanted to jump in, that would be great. Um, first of all, let me just say, I, I don't think actually uh, I think we may find some surprises if we look at the data. Um, and so, for example, actually, uh, Matthew Hayek, one of our colleagues, had one of these questions. We did a presentation in, in context of Climate Week and talked about what actually is less uh, emissions intensive, receiving something from a local market or receiving something from, from California, across the country. Uh, and the answer was receiving something that was actually more, was actually closer. So. Uh, I think, in fact, we might find some surprises if we look at the data, and that's why it's important to look at the data. But I think the second thing, and I think a big problem we have, is that we tend to very much take a silo approach. And that's one reason why we're trying to look at food systems. So, for example, I worked at the International Energy Agency. We look at the issue in terms of fuel consumption, but mostly fuel production. We tend not to look at it so much in terms of the interaction between energy and food systems. And I must admit, I find even when I talk to my colleagues in this process, you know, for example, the FAO has very much of a food orientation, and then that often equates to agriculture and production and, and uh, flora, uh, land use changes, rather than what's happening on the energy side. So I think, in fact, we have, we have a problem because we're not actually analyzing some of these issues <clears throat> in an integrated manner. If I could sort of analogize. On the building side, there's more of an effort to analyze things on an integrated matter. And building includes a lot of different sources, uh, sources and uses. Uh, and I don't think we've actually managed to do that on the food system side. So that's just in some ways part of my, I think there's actually a real need to actually expand the modeling, coming back to Alex's point. In fact, I don't think we have enough inputs coming in to create a, a systemic model that looks at what's happening on food specifically. I don't know if anybody else has any reactions or wanted to raise any other points. Alex? Yeah, so uh, just to respond to Samir, I mean, I think uh, one of the things I've been struck with, um, I've been working a lot with the Iconics group that that develops the, uh, the SSPs, the Shared Socioeconomic Pathways. 
And um, one of my main goals there is to help them um, elaborate within the sectors. So if you look at the SSPs right now, um, some of the original ones were very basic. It would basically, it would have lines like, you know, agricultural productivity increases. There, there isn't really like detail in there of exactly what that means in the full energy profile. So I think part of it is their eyes are opening to this. This is getting more and more detailed. Uh, some of the AgNIP economics team leaders have helped develop our representative agricultural pathways within the SSP framework. Um, but just that basic question of if we're not including food waste in those scenarios, what kind of secondary feedback loops or um, or unintended consequences are we setting ourselves up for? And we see this all the time that there are component risks within the system and there are systemic risks that result directly from the interconnection of the components. Um, so, so in the systems community, one thing that we're very fond of is finding what we call warm data, which is interrelational data that says that something will respond, particularly because of its relationship to something else. So I think I think if we could find some of those, there would be very fertile ground for for additional policy making. I think that's an that's an excellent set of points. Um, I will say again, I mean, I, I actually see also a, a scoping issue. Um, uh, and so, for example, um, only re relatively recently has there been more of an intent to look at some of the methane leakages that are occurring upstream when it comes to uh, production of plastics for, for packaging. Um, uh, so, you know, I mean, for me, it was, it was fascinating to see there was an explosion of discussions of methane in the oil and gas sector because of all the leaks, explosion of the discussion of methane uh, in the livestock and agriculture, uh, but maybe less of a sort of a systemic approach, particularly on the energy side, to look at how those plastic products are being used, what they're being used for, and are there opportunities in terms of what they're being used for to actually uh, reduce that that demand. Again, I mean, one important question, it's not clear what makes more sense from an emission side from what I've seen, uh, local produce or uh, imported mass produced produce. I mean, just to come back to that, um, because I, I see it so often, um, I created a, a, a kind of, yeah, a social venture called One Planet Kitchen whose sole mission was to kind of educate the average consumer about the best way they could, let's say, uh, reduce their, their ecological footprint. And uh, I basically said, well, okay, you don't have to invest in all these things, but you do have to change how you consume. Um, that's like the most direct, most immediate, uh, low hanging fruit that you could, you could incorporate into your daily life. And our core messaging, because we realized the data is complicated. Um, how do you then empower people to make sound decisions? And we came up with Three basic points, uh, which I'm sure people here would probably refute a bit, would be about the, uh, you know, go as veggie as you can, go as organic as you can, go as local as you can. Of course, very much dependent on your local context. That's doable, for example, in Western Europe, uh, very doable, in fact, um, without having to rely heavily on imports. But, uh, but that's not the average consumer. So we started doing these cooking events <laughs> to try to showcase what's possible. Um, and we made one exception to that rule, which was about uh, spices, because we all like tasty food and we, we do recognize that, okay, but that's just a small percentage of the portion of the meal, so we can sleep well at night and, uh, you know, we've done our bit. Um, but this was kind of the messaging that we, we, we came back to, because if we start saying, all right, uh, I, mean, I mean, we can make a whole database out of products that people should select from based on the season and so on. And how does that translate to what you see in the market? No, it doesn't. So it becomes extremely difficult to, um, to make that message clear to your consumer because this is where we want to actuate it at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, I, if you have a, a point that I could, or I don't know, some, some information that I could use or uh, that could sort of help that decision-making process um, in what we've already done, then that would be helpful. Uh, Vijaya Gopal? Good afternoon. This is uh, Gopal Kakani at uh, Oklahoma State University. Uh, just I had a couple of quick comments on the key data and modeling gaps. So one of the issues in terms of the 
greenhouse gas emissions as it relates to agriculture is uh, irrigated versus dryland. And I think most of the times uh, the IPCC or other projects are mostly based on the irrigated agriculture. And some of our studies say, especially here in the Oklahoma, Texas and Kansas panhandle, they show very low emissions, uh, especially uh, during the summer months when we have a very dry uh, season here. So in terms of some of the key data issues that are related how they can be filled probably more field experimentation is needed to collect data from these uh, dry land regions. And also in terms of the modeling gaps, and when we are talking about these emissions, uh, most of it is uh, regulated by the microbes. And often uh, that's one of the missing portions in the modeling routines we have, even the, except for a couple of models like the DNBC or Descent, uh, most of the models are deficient in uh, simulating some of these microbial responses to the environmental conditions and in turn related to the emissions. So probably some thoughts or how uh, we should address those might be useful in terms of moving this, uh, uh, getting the emissions right from the various systems that we are working with. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for that. I mean, I, and I would sort of say, for me, two, two thoughts come out of those very interesting comments. The first is what people tend to think of in terms of relevant solutions has to do with very much where they live and what are the conditions that they face. So, you know, you're in Oklahoma, as you said, it's a little dry out there. And so uh, thinking a lot about the, the dry agriculture, it's probably something people in many other parts of the world don't really think enough about. So is, are there solutions in that? And then I think the second thing too, just sort of, and for me to, to be frank, this has been my experience in working in this effort and even participating in this uh, AgMid or going to some COP uh, and IPCC things. I, you know, I tend to come in from the energy side. What I tend to find is that there often isn't enough cross-sectoral uh, joint efforts. Uh, and I think that in and of itself uh, creates some major modeling gaps. So we don't really have, we tend to have models that tend to focus on components. The IA has a great energy model. Uh, and uh, a lot of time it focuses a little, probably too much on production issues and alternative ways of low carbon sources of energy rather than other things. And I think the last point I would make, which I think is very relevant to what we're talking about here, is there is also a tendency on the climate side, and I say this coming from the energy side, to focus on production and not on consumption. Uh, and so to think a little more about what are the opportunities on the consumption side, uh, I think would also be important. So I think the conceptualization then has an impact on the nature of the data we want and the modeling we want. And sometimes maybe the conceptualization has been a little too sectoral. If I can jump in without raising my hand. Um, yes. The, uh, I, think, I think this is... Um, yeah, there's some interesting things here, and, and I, I, I'm trying to jump off of Gopal's uh, comments about the microbial side. I would imagine on the global emissions policy level, you don't need to be resolving the microorganisms in the soils. But of course, you wouldn't have any of those greenhouse gas exchanges without those uh, kind of uh, microbial environments. So this is, this is kind of underscoring a scale issue, um, which is how do we get the information from cropping system models and we have i'm just scanning the participants list here we have some great field experimentalists on the call um and how do we get how do we get their expertise up to scale um and i think some of that is just creating frameworks and input output and uh kind of community discussions such as what we're having today um but another way of thinking about it is at a certain point everything is parameterized or turned into a scenario. So the global scale often is turned into a scenario for the smaller scale, like a RCP 8.5 future concentration pathway. Um, and likewise, the emissions that come out of the entire world's rice paddies, you know, turns into just a number that goes into to an energy model maybe. Um, so one of the things we need to maybe think about is how do we prioritize the areas that we would like to have more conversation around. Can we can we figure out, stop talking about rice, start, start talking about upland versus paddy. Uh, stop talking about 
all livestock start talking about ruminant versus non-ruminant, you know, that kind of thing. I know that those conversations have been had, but we can probably go further and find those areas uh, that are ripe for a little bit more discussion. Right, but if I could also, I think what's important is to figure out who do we need to have around the table? Who's not around the table that maybe would be an important partner to have around the table? So in, I think in both your cases, Gopal and like you're talking about drilling down a little, uh, but even as we drill down, are there other parties that are that are critical in this? Now I've seen, I think in both those cases, the whole issue of clean cooking technologies isn't necessarily a very relevant thing, but you could have chosen other areas where immediately the link to clean cooking technologies would have become important. And then that would have had an impact on how we think things would potentially uh, evolve going forward. So I think both those, uh, both those, both your comments are, are from both of you are, are excellent, but I also think there's a critical question of who else do we need to get around the table to, to sort of figure out the best way to conceptualize the models. Just just scaling up a little bit, uh, to jump from microbial to a little bit higher level, probably uh, most of the literature shows that soil temperature and soil moisture are the major drivers for the microbial activity and in turn the emissions. So if you're able to capture uh, with improved accuracy the soil temperature and the soil moisture, I think that would uh, help us to scale up to a say to the global level where probably you can capture those two parameters using satellites and if you have a better resolution on those satellites to say as I said field level so probably using Landsat and other types of inputs to capture the soil moisture and temperature. And then rather than deriving those uh, from the air temperature, if you're able to measure uh, the soil temperature and uh, the soil moisture accurately, rather than deriving it from the rainfall and the uh, air temperature probably would have a better resolution on the emission estimates. Great, great. Well, thanks for that. I mean, I think that obviously points to the importance of improved data, improved data collection, and you gotta love those computers that have opened up so much in terms of our ability to analyze things. Though I also often feel that the power of the computers also maybe tends to, to overly influence the way we tend to try to resolve issues. Uh, we're a little over time, so I don't wanna keep you all. Uh, thank you very much for participating uh, in this breakout session. Uh, Kevin uh, was kind enough to take some notes and we'll lead the, the report out. Uh, and we look forward to continuing uh, this issue. Uh, we know food's very important to all of us and food's uh, probably more important on the emissions front than people have recognized before. So how we can resolve uh, those two uh, issues, serve those two goals uh, uh, will be very important going forward. So let me let you all return now to the uh, main session. And again, thanks for participating in this breakout. Thank you.